Hi and welcome. I'm delighted to be joined today by Sarah Manning of Clarion Solicitors. How are you, Sarah? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me. Excellent. My pleasure. It's really good to, for you to join us today. So Sarah is a senior associate solicitor and accredited family mediator and highly experienced, having previously worked in family law for over 10 years. She advises and assists individuals in all aspects of private family law matters. Um, she also has reams of other things to her name, but you'll be able to read all about that in the bio of this podcast. Um, but to start with, we're going to get cracking. So today we're going to be talking about mediation um, because January is mediation month. So there's lots of things going on this month about mediation. And it's something that's really close to my heart because it helps people to divorce amicably and out of court. Um, so tell me a bit more about how you get involved um, in mediation, Sarah. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, so in terms of my involvement for the mediation, we get referrals either direct from the general public. Um, sometimes people come to us and they've not yet started the process and they come through to a mediator or I get referrals from other solicitors. So parties might already have their solicitor and they're exploring mediation as a means to resolve their financial or children dispute. OK, I suppose we should start off by explaining what mediation is. So what's what's the difference between mediation and using a traditional family lawyer so the difference with mediation so obviously I am a practicing solicitor as well as a family mediator so I have to make sure I've got the right hat on with each um, <laughs> jobs that I do because for any if, if I was dealing with it for a legal matter I obviously couldn't do the mediation for my clients I'd have to send them off to another mediator and the same the other way as well um, I couldn't give legal advice to my mediation clients so I've got to make sure that um which capacity they're in, I stick with that same hat on. Um, sorry, so again, the, the beginning question. So. <laughs> tell me about, tell me what, what, what is mediation? What's the difference between mediation and just using a normal family lawyer? Yeah, so the difference with the mediation is, so when I'm dealing with it in the mediation capacity, um, I can't give legal advice. So I'm there, as I always say, a bit like a referee, you know, between between them both to try come up with some sort of solutions. Um, and because I'm a practicing solicitor as well, we do follow the same sort of protocol. So say, for instance, in financial matters, we might do the financial disclosure part still and, um, and, and go through that. But I'm not giving the parties um, advice. That's what they need to go through to their solicitors. I'm there as a mutual third party and impartial to try and move things along and get a resolution between them. Because often what happens with when you with solicitors is you, you get your client to come in, you take their instructions maybe for an hour, you write a letter, it gets sent to the other parties. Um, it might take a few more weeks before they reply. Then they get their client in, draft a letter, client's got to approve it, goes to the person. Before you know it, months have gone by just dealing with the general um, questions that have gone on and it's not really progressing things forward. And sometimes the other parties read the letter and read it in a different context than that, what they mean. So getting both parties in a room together with myself there, then we can look at them issues and get answers straight away rather than having to wait. So it is much more cost effective and it's a much quicker process. And sometimes, like I say, depending on which solicitor you instruct, um, some are more litigious in their approach and, you know, the way that they write letters, it can be construed differently. Um, and I think that's really important, especially with children matters that, you know, parents are there to co-parent um, and, you know, to deal with things. And I think sometimes things get lost in translation through solicitors. So I think if people are able to sit down and work it out, I think mediation is much more amicable, amicable way of dealing with with disputes. Yeah, absolutely. So if I've if I've understood this right mediation is you're not going to advise them in any way you're there to keep them on track and make sure that they're moving forward properly and actually getting somewhere in terms of answering questions that that what each party has and trying to come to some sort of agreement and that can be on either financial matters or it can be to do with the children or can it be both it can be both. So often I deal with both. Um, sometimes people are doing financial matters through their solicitor and they come to me for children. So I can do one. And I always explain to 
clients that it's it's their process so I can do as much or as little as, as they want to sometimes they've done all the they want me to do all the finances and they just need to speak about maybe child maintenance or um, they've got everything and they just want to have a more detailed plan um, for the children so I can do as much or as little as as the, the parties want really and I always say to them that's what's good about mediation is the flexibility um, of that really yeah absolutely so there are um a number of different types of mediation models so could can you just run through the different options that are available for mediation yeah so um in terms of the what i'd call the um traditional model where i'd get both parties in together um it'd be myself sat there with them both in the room um a lot of the times i'm saying in the room but that could be also on zoom um but all on the same screen together um, since the pandemic, it's becoming more the norm, I feel, um, for it to be done on Zoom, and it's whatever parties feel comfortable. Um, but I have started now doing face-to-face -face mediations. So that's the more traditional model. And then I'm also qualified to do the hybrid mediation, um, which allows parties to have professionals involved in the mediation process. But even before, even the traditional model, you can have um, parties on a shuttle basis. So if the parties don't want to see each other, they don't even want to be on the same screen and Zoom, on Zoom or in person, I can deal with them separately on a shuttle basis. Um, if people need that additional support, say they needed a divorce coach with them for support, or they wanted a financial neutral with them, or they wanted their solicitor to be present, the hybrid mediation or um, like an advanced model of mediation can also work to help that dispute because if it is high net worth, um, complex financial matters, having that additional support from solicitors does help because I'd always say in my mediations, because I can't give legal advice, Will um, one of the tasks to do for the next one is go get the legal advice. So sometimes that can delay matters um, because then you've got to both go get your solicitors and then come back. Whereas if the solicitors was in the room with them at that same time, it can be a lot more um, cost effective because we're dealing with it. And again, we haven't got that where they've got to get appointments in. Um, so it's up to the clients to sort of weigh up that and how cost effective cost effective it is for them and also I think the hybrid is really good for when there's high conflict between the parties um because when you are going back and forth between the rooms on a shuttle basis sometimes the other person sat for maybe 15 minutes 20 minutes on the road and they can feel like they're in a pressure cooker um mm. so sometimes I've gone to say like the wife and she's um and asked her a question and I'm coming back to tell the husband he's been sat there for 15 minutes he's wrote down loads of questions that he wants to know and I'm trying to then tell him what the wife said and they're wanting to talk at you and it's so hard to manage the situation. Whereas I think if they were sat there with their solicitor, they've been able to talk to somebody in between or if they had a divorce coach with them and they've got someone to talk in that time and, and be aware of what's been going on and maybe reframe what I've already said to them, talk it through. And I just think sometimes for them, the hybrid mediation would be a good place for like the high conflict, complex matters. Yeah, absolutely. So. Does hybrid mediation always take place as shuttle, as in where the parties are in different rooms, or does some of it take place all in the same room? Um, no, it can. It, it, it's a bit to their own. I think if people are getting on um, together and they're happy to see each other face to face with the hybrid, it would be good to get everybody together in one room to explain, um, you know, like the agreement to mediate that we have to do and the 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 rules of how mediation is going to go and how things are planned. It's good to have speak to everyone as a whole but then you would in the shuttle with a hybrid model you would have to then go in separate rooms for me to go back and forth but it doesn't mean that we can't all have group sessions and again I'm very flexible and it's up to each individual circumstances of and, and what they want to do if they're happy to do that all together but the, the the norm it would be to sort of get together at the beginning then go separately and it may be that you come back together at the end you know if you've been able to reach an agreement um, but yeah, it's, it, it is obviously, um, it is flexible and I think that's what's great about the hybrid mediation. Yeah, absolutely. And something that, that strikes me about the hybrid is that quite often you hear stories where in, in traditional mediation, the clients have come to an agreement, but then go off to their individual solicitors and the solicitors are questioning the agreement they've come to. I, I assume that by having the solicitors there in the room involved in the mediation, like they are in hybrid, you can avoid that to some extent. Is that the case? Yeah, yeah. So one one of the things as well that people do, and I explain this to them in the assessment meeting, is that we can start off as the traditional model that they're they're doing it together, and then when they've reached, they're coming to reach an agreement or the final stages that the solicitors come involved at that point, 
and then they can what usually would happen is I draft what's called a memorandum of understanding setting out what they've agreed and um, but the solicitors could come in that last session and they could agree the terms of the consent order and bash it out between them if they want an agreement to a certain clause then um I could um obviously um I could obviously you know speak to them about that and go back and forth because one of the mediations that um I had before um where for myself I was a solicitor and I'd referred it to mediation. One of the cases that unraveled from mediation was the fact that um, they'd not looked at who's going to pay for the pension share. Um, so my client was the husband and he just said, I've had enough. She won't even agree that. Let's just forget the whole thing. And it ended up at court. Whereas I think if I'd have gone into that last session for the mediation, we'd have talked, we'd have crossed all the T's, dotted the I's, and we'd have avoided that situation. But because the mediator didn't discuss that, it was like the icing on the cake, you know, for my client, that he just had enough that he'd had to brunt paying for everything and um, so I think um, you know that that does help a lot yeah I think you're right um, and the, there's another part to hybrid mediation in that you can hold confidences can't you as a as a mediator in hybrid yeah so in terms of the confidences yeah so at first when I went on the hybrid training I thought the main difference was having professionals involved but I think one of the main reasons is the confidences that you can keep and that does really help when you do the shuttle basis because separated parents parties want to tell you lots of stuff and it's not really relevant you don't yeah. want to say ignore it but it's not relevant to moving forwards and reaching an agreement so um and we before you go in the hybrid which is a bit more like the civil model um you would write down exactly what you're going to go back with the other side um and try help um, you know the fact that one party's dis decided they're a narcissist or this and that is not really we can't change people how they are it's not helpful for moving things forwards to get um a settlement done if we're then going back and saying that's what's been said or it's been said when we're all in the room so i can you know we can take things out than than what the other person you know needs to know and equally for settlement purposes when we're going back and forth we're very clear in what's been said we're going back with a clear offer Whereas when you do the traditional model, I have, even when it's on a shuttle, you've got to be really, you know, that you're not keeping anything from the other part of it. It's very transparent and it's a lot of pressure as a mediator to do that when you're trying to write notes and manage both parties um, in each room where you're really conscious how long you've left the other person and things. So it gives that more flexibility um, with the hybrid. Yeah, absolutely. And from your experience how would a financial neutral because you mentioned that before so i suppose we should start off by um talking about what a financial neutral is so can you explain what they are to begin with yeah so a financial neutral would is really helpful in the mediation process because they uh, like myself as a mediator they're impartial so they're not acting for one person or the other and they could come into the mediation and look at well what what will their financial position be um, and affect on them both with pensions and things um, if we went on this settlement so one of the things of a case I'm doing now is it's not about looking short term of how it's going to meet the party's needs now it's about looking well let's have a look on retirement what would that mean for them if they got this much of the pension or this much what would it mean for them at that time um, and I think having somebody involved at that time and even talking about things like insurances life insurance and having that information because as a solicitor mediator myself I'm not able to give financial advice so having someone there with us um, is helpful and also the um, cash flow models you know to look at if the, the wife had say or the husband had an income of this what how would that meet their needs and stuff so I think it's really good to be um, if you're able to see it on a graph or more imagery of that and so that the parties can actually see oh this is what it will actually look like it's really helpful to move things forward yeah absolutely so the financial neutrals not not providing advice just to one person they're giving the advice to both parties and i think the other thing is that they um they're hearing it from the same person so for example if you're talking through the pensions and what benefits they they offer and how they work both parties are hearing it from the same person rather than one hearing it from their advisor and the other hearing it from somebody different and mm. maybe not explained in the same way. So um, I think that can be that can be useful. So in terms of um, of that, how I assume that they would exchange financial information and then you'd bring it financial neutral into the process later on. 
Yeah, so when you get to the proposal stages, so I tend to say to clients, the first session that you have is to deal with financial disclosure because any solicitor advising the client in mediation would say, we can't give you any specific legal advice until we've seen full and frank financial disclosure. So I think it's really important to get that part out and ask any questions they have, um, you know, if they're happy with everything that's been disclosed. Because if they're not, then it might be the end of the road for mediation because I can't compel somebody to produce bank statements if they're saying they don't want to do it or they can't agree on the business valuation. So we need to get all that part of the things out of the way. And then I think the financial neutral would come in if when we have a session to deal with um, proposals on the table and and look at that yeah no that makes that makes a lot of sense so for the clients I know you've talked about cost being a benefit of using hybrid mediation um my uh I suppose financial brains thinking hang on a minute I'm going to have there's going to be two solicitors in the room and a mediator Possibly at some point there's going to be a financial advisor. That sounds like a lot of people that I'm going to be paying yeah. to all of them rather than just paying a mediator. What what would you say to that? I think that, um, well, for me, my cost as a mediator, I don't charge anything more for the hybrid mediation um, per hour than I would do for a normal mediation. I think what's different is there'd probably be more prep work and I'd have to charge something for preparation. I might have conversations with the financial neutral and the solicitor separately beforehand so we all agree how it's going to run. Um, so and, and the sessions tend to last longer than a traditional model, which tends to be an hour and a half to two hours. So there is additional costs in that. But if you compare that to the cost of going to litigation, so if, if mediation doesn't succeed, the next thing is if they want to go to court, then they would have to go through the financial process, um, financial disclosure process again, the, the documents and the cost then go through the roof. So I still think it is more cost effective with it. And, I, and also with it being more hybrid, you'd use in more like complex or high net worth cases um, that you, you're stopping it from going to court and having more experts involved. And I think you can, you know, so Simpson's just instructing a pension actuary um, you know, letters can go back and forth between solicitors of what we're actually asking the actuary. A financial neutral can assist with what terms we're going to do and they can assist because I can't as a mediator in that session, obviously with my solicitor head on, I'd be able to say what I should do, but I can't say what they should and shouldn't be putting in that letter where a financial neutral will be able to speak to both parties, find out what they want and we could help do that with the solicitors, which might assist a little bit more. Yeah, so it, it's it's some a time saving as much as anything above the traditional version yeah. of mediation um but obviously a, co a huge cost saving compared with the the cost of going to court and it seems also it's an emotional saving if i don't know how you measure that but the the emotional toll of of going to court and and also the time scales at the moment because it, it seems to be a long time to get an appointment in court at the moment. I don't know. Is that yeah. has that been your experience as well? Yeah, definitely. And you, you stuck to the court's timetable as well. If we did a hybrid mediation, we have everybody round. We've agreed it in everyone's diaries. Um, we have fantastic facilities here at Clarion with plenty of rooms that we can accommodate and park in. Um, where when you go to court, that's out of your control. You get given a date. You don't know what judge you're going to get. Um, and um, there's certain process that you have to follow and the process is the same whether you work stacking shelves in Tesco and you earn minimal wage to you were a multi-million pound business owner there's the same process in the documents that you have to go through and it can be quite expensive um, so that I think that's the, that's the difference with with it really and like I said the flexibility where the court is so rigid in their procedures and processes yeah no i think i think you're absolutely right and and certainly some of the delays that there are at the moment in the court process it's it's certainly good to to consider these other options as well and i'm never a massive fan of court because i think it it can be tricky afterwards for parenting if you've had this court battle and spent huge amounts of money on um on going through court and essentially it's money that comes out of of the family pot doesn't it you know, it's, I do sometimes think that people think there's this um, divorce fairy that will come along and pay the divorce costs, but in reality, that's uh, that's not not a thing, is it? So, no, and I think as well with the, um, I don't just say mediation. All right, well, mediation's not worked. 
um, go to court, I explore other avenues of alternative dispute resolution. So one of the cases I did, we agreed everything at mediation, apart from who was going to stay in the family home. So it seemed disproportionate to go to court and exchange financial disclosure, go through all the process, the hearings, for when that was the only issue. So they went to arbitration then, and they dealt with it on paper. And they both put the case forwards for an arbitrator to make that decision. So I can also assist in the hybrid process of where they go next and what, what they do um, and, and help in that way as well. That's interesting. So when the case, when that go, went to arbitration and it was just that one question being asked of the arbitrator um how did how did that work then do, were they supported by their solicitors did, or did yeah. they still have to get um counsel involved and so on well it, it was difficult because as a media that happened and i never hear anything back from that which is ah. which is frustrating but in a solicitor capacity where we've dealt with things like that before you would then get um you'd probably most likely get a barrister to assist with the drafting of the application or if if depending on how straightforward your solicitor might just be able to help you if it's on paper um, and you put your argument forward and then you, you get a response back and you both agree to then to, to deal with it on that basis. So, it, oh, right. OK, this is news to me. <laughs> <laughs> so you can get an arbitrator to, to deal with something and you don't meet with the arbitrator. You just put your arguments forward. You like, can agree to paper. do it on paper, yeah. Yeah. Wow, I didn't know that was even a thing. Obviously, if it's complex, if it's more than just, it happens a bit, you know, with children, if they can't agree with something that's happening, obviously yeah. finances, um, it might be not as, but, but you might be able, if you know, if you like a few, you're not far apart and then you decide to go to an arbitrator because the financial disclosure is not an issue. Whereas if you went to court, you'd have to have your first appointment. You'd have to complete updated form E's. You'd have to ask questionnaires on that. You know, there's a whole process. And then you can't, you you wouldn't be able to just jump straight to um, the FDR or final hearing if that's what you needed. Because you've already tried to negotiate. You need the final hearing. Well, there's processes that you have to go. So it might be, you know, six to nine months or something before you get that reply where with the arbitrator, you can find a local arbitrator. It doesn't, well, it doesn't even have to be local. It can be anybody in the country. And you can find an arbitrator specific to family where judge, you might not get one that's specifically to that area um, and get them to um, look at it on that basis. So I think it's it's a really good option. It's a pity I don't know the outcome of that case, but I'm pretty sure they've got a decision of <laughs> husband and wife, but um, you know, yeah, it's and it's they have to thing. agree to abide by the arbitrator as well, don't they? Yeah, yeah. So that it's it is essentially like having a, a judge make a judgment. Yeah, yeah. So that that's really that's really useful. I didn't realise you could have an arbitrator get involved just to to make one one decision. Yeah, um, so say for instance, pensions are always a big massive um, issue oh, that comes up, um, <laughs> <laughs> as you know. Um, so that could be, you know, if it's just the pension that they can't agree on, that's something that's um, worth looking at. And then yeah, that's really interesting. So um, I'm interested, we've we've spoken to um, Rhys Taylor about arbitration and about private FDRs, actually. Yeah. And I'm, I'm interested in what would, what as from kind of the mediation point, if there's still something that, that's up for debate, why would you choose an arbitrator over, over, for example, using a private FDR? Um, because a private FDR is not, um, you don't have to agree to it. So then you could end up spending all that money on a private FDR and then starting the court process. Um, arbitration, right. it needs to be, you know, abided by. Right. Okay. Okay. So the uh, private FDR is an indication of what, what the they might feel might should happen, but they don't have to abide by it. Is that? That's is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's so you've got to have both parties quite dedicated to it. If there's a, you know, it's probably not the right process if you think that someone's not going to agree agree to that. Yeah, they're not going to follow the outcome. Because it's the same risk when you go to um, an FDR um, that you get the judge that gives you an indication of what they'd say would be the outcome. And then if you decide to go to a final hearing and not listen to them, there's a risk you get, obviously that same judge doesn't look at the case again. Um, so you risk getting another judge that has a different opinion. So the FDR is giving that opinion, which might help the parties to settle when someone's looked at it independent from them. Um, so that's the hope of the FDR, whereas the arbitration, you'd get an outcome. Yeah, absolutely. It seems pretty, 
Right, so it's just that people take a car fee. To, I think that was what, why people still go down cart is because you get a cart fee that you have to pay, which is minimal. And then um, you don't pay for each hearing that you have. You don't pay for that judge. Well, when you do arbitration, you're paying for the judge's time and you might have to hire some premises and, you know, for it to take place at and things like that. So I think, you know, it, it is quicker and, um, and you're more in control. Um, but yeah, I think people see that the court, because you pay this court fee and you don't have to pay anything else. Um, so I think there's, that's why people do it really. Yeah, court can still be expensive though if you've got counsel involved and um, and if it if it rolls over to a different day or or whatever. Um, yeah, can yeah. can still be uh, st <laughs> can still be a pain, can't it? Oh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's fantastic. Is there anything else that that I should have asked you about um, about hybrid mediation? Um, I just I think you've um, you've covered most of the things. I think you know in terms of me about why choose hybrid mediation. I think the things that I'd see is that it's cost effective. You've got the benefit of legal advice in the session if that's the professional that you're using. It's quicker with fewer sessions required. Less likely to fail because everybody's involved in that session. Um, I do think it reduces conflicts and eliminates protracted correspondence, you know, between the parties that can sometimes inflame situations. I feel like parties feel empowered. So uh, I think hybrid's really good, you know, like with domestic violence, which is something we haven't talked about, oh. um, where if they, you know, if they were to go to court, they would still see that other person at sure. court or even if you have screens you're still hearing their voice well through the hybrid mediation on a shuttle I can make sure they don't see each other at all or hear from the other person um, and it's dealt with in a confidential nature um, and I think sometimes that that can be difficult for people um, as an where people previously had say oh this domestic violence mediation is not suitable well now it's done on zoom and things like that they can be sat in the comfort of their own home they're not at risk coming into the office because even before when we'd say oh well they won't see each other i still can't control what goes on outside of the building at least people when they're in their own home on zoom if someone comes at the door you can phone the police and things like that and i think having or when there's a real imbalance of powers between both parties where i did a hybrid mediation where it was i was the solicitor and it not the mediator and my client was has been suffered from domestic violence in a mental capacity, um, where he was quite overpowering the mediations. But I was there with her to talk on her behalf, and she felt empowered and able to speak up. Where sometimes at mediation, if there is that coercive control or domestic violence, that they don't feel that they can um, voice their concerns or feel that they're able to stand up to the other person. So it, it, it's a good option for me when I do the assessment means when I speak to both parties to have that as an option to them. And when I'm discussing it, people are really wanting to and take it on board as well yeah I think that's really worth saying isn't it because like you say people who are experiencing domestic violence they don't necessarily want to go to court because they don't want to see that other person but they don't want to sit in mediation but if they're on zoom and then they don't even see that other person on screen because they're in shuttle so they're in one room and you're and their partner or ex-partner is in another room and they've got their solicitor with them so they can Kind of talk them down a bit as well i think that's that's really a really good idea and they can have a divorce coach with them as well can't they yeah yeah if that's what they're wanting to to do and i think sometimes having the support of the divorce coach when i'm with the other party speaking to them that they refrain things that i've said or if there's something that triggers their domestic violence um that the um divorce coach can help um reframe what's been said and that's what's good about doing the hybrid that I can take away what the other party is saying. I'm saying husband and wife, but it can obviously be either. I can reframe what the other party is saying to not trigger something off of like PTSD and, and you know, from a traumatic event that they've got. So the thing about holding confidence in hybrid mediation, I can look at, well, we need to reach a settlement. Whether they like it or not, they're going to have to, if it's children or finances, talk things through. But at least they're not having to listen to that person and, you know, trigger things that they've done before it can be dealt with in a much more controlled way than even court because I once had a, an issue, a court case and there were domestic violence and there was literally a screen between us you could see see the other person's hands flying about you know when there was quite expression when they were moving and you can hear the voice and I think it's not just about seeing them it's 
triggering something off of listening to them as well. And with the court hearings, even though they're a bit better now, they're on Microsoft Teams or on BT Meet Me, but it's still triggering that them issues of listening to them speak. Um, yeah. That's really good. That's something that I hadn't thought of because more and more I am coming across cases where there's, and it may not be physical violence in terms of domestic abuse, but it might be economic abuse, financial abu abuse, or like say coercive control. And to not have to hear that other person, I think a lot of clients who aren't even considering mediation because they're like, oh, well, I, I couldn't be in the same room as him or her. That option is is there to for them, isn't it? I think that's yeah. um, that's a really good point to make. And Zoom's great on that with the breakout rooms because with a click and a button, I'm moving between the rooms, and it, it, it's it's really easy to do and manage. Yeah, yeah, and you're not accidentally going to put them all in one room. <laughs> but when I first started doing that, I was practicing with everybody in the office to move people around. You know, if you've been <laughs> but you know, once you've got the knack of it, it's it's really easy to do. That's good. That's good. Fantastic. Is there anything else um, that you want to add to what we've said? Um, no, no. I, th I think we've um, we've covered ev everything. The only other thing that um, just just to mention about how I deal with um, things as a solicitor mediator when we're doing it. So as a mediation, we I don't tend to use like the financial booklets um, that I know that some other mediators do. I've tended to do with the for me, which is the document that they use at court. And I think by me supporting parties through um, the mediation, I can help them fill them in if they need to. And then if mediation breaks down, they've got then that document and they're used to the format of a for me and they're not then paying for the solicitors to then go through it. And also with the assistance of divorce coaches, they use the term, you know, explain the terminologies and things like that with them. Um, so for me as a solicitor mediator I tend to use the for me straight away not to donor but I think then we've got more time that we can go through things so they're used to this form so if court does happen they're not then then sent another form to fill out they've got it already ready and um, so it's for me it's mediation is not always suitable for everyone I can't make wave a magic wand to make people compromise and negotiate but what we can do is then do as much as we can in mediation to either set it up for other alternative dispute resolutions to resolve the matter or at least prepare them for then if they go into court that they're not duplicating costs and time and that they know what's happening with the next so that's something that I feel quite passionate about as a mediator yeah no I think that's absolutely right we we do similarly and use and use for me because they don't want to be paying lots of different professionals lots of different money to fill this give the same information just in different formats I think so yeah, yeah I think you're absolutely right on that Sarah, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you about this. Um, and yeah, thank you. And I, I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Yeah, thank you. All right, cheers. Yeah.